I'm honored today. Right now, we're going into part two of a mini series that we started last week called Overcomer. And uh, we talked last week about how, um, how we have labels in our lives that, that we've, we've picked up labels. Maybe people have given us labels in our lives. And these labels, we have to learn how to break those labels. And for a lot of us, we don't realize that some of the labels that we have in our lives were as a result of wounds that we've carried in our lives. I shared with you last week that, you know, I'm, I'm my personality. I'm the type of person that, that I'm really easygoing, really easy to get along with, and, and uh, I'm not really easily offended. And what happens is you might, we might joke or you might say something, you might be mad at me, and I'm really quick to forgive you. But the truth is, and I've learned this recently about myself, is that still the wound is there. I might have brushed over. And there's a lot of you that are like me. You're like, oh, it's okay. I forgave them. It's not a big deal. But when a similar situation arises, you find some feelings start to rise up in your heart. And what that means is that there's a wound inside of us that never healed properly. And as a result, that wound keeps us trapped in a sense in how we respond in our relationships, how we are with people, even how we react or interact with others or even make decisions in our, because what happens, we'll find that some of the decisions that we make in our lives can be based out of fear instead of faith. And it all has to do with these things. So what I want to share with you today in part two, I want to talk to you about how do you get past your personal failures? Let's talk about how do we get past personal failures? We've all had them. Whether you've had a, uh, your emotional failures, relationship failures, if you've had financial failures, business failures, uh, whatever, family failures, we've all had failures. And if you haven't, please tell me what the secret is to your, to your sauce because everybody in this room, has everybody in here failed at least at one thing, right? Okay, we've all had failures. I want to make sure that I'm not the only one and this is like a, you guys are here to watch me fail at this message. Just making sure. All right, so we've all had these failures because truthfully, all of us have done something that we wish we've never done. We've all said something that we wish we would have never said, right? And here's the truth that a lot of us, for a lot of people, it is very difficult for us to get past our past. It's very hard. Now we know, now we know that we serve a good, faithful, loving God that already has forgiven us. He's forgiven us. If we've repented, he has forgiven us. But do you know that the most difficult thing to do even when other people has forgiven you, the most difficult thing is for us to forgive ourselves. We are hard on ourselves. So what we do is we create, we, we become, I don't know, we, we, this crazy monster that we become because, oh no, I, we, we beat ourselves up all the time. We are the hardest person to forgive. God's forgiven us. The person you offended forgave you. The person you hurt might have even forgiven you, but you have not forgiven yourself. So how do we get past that? How do we get past that? You know, I know for that for some of us, maybe in your past, you, you, there was some heaviness in your life because maybe you had a, a very, very busy sexual past. Maybe you did some things that at the time seemed right and felt right, right? But today, time has passed. Years later, now there's baggage. There's some weight. There's some guilt in your life. And today might even be affecting your marriage. Maybe your present state of thinking. You, when you say to yourself, man, I wish I really would have never done that. So you live with regret. This, for some of us, it could be a recurring sin where something that we thought we dealt with and we keeps coming up over and over again. We go to God, we pray for forgiveness and there we go. Two, three weeks have passed and there it is again. And there it is again. You fall back into it and you feel like you've been carrying this weight from your past. You feel like you're never going to get past this thing. And you say, will I ever be able to shake this thing off of me? And that is, again, our past haunting us. And some of us, it's something you, something that you said to a loved one that you didn't really mean. No, you meant it because the Bible says that out of the heart, you know, something that you said that you wish you could unsay, but you can't. Come on, we've all been there. And it's affecting today the, your intimacy or closeness with that person. Some of us, we've made bad decisions in our past and it's catching up to us today and and so, so some of us, what we do is we're afraid. What will, pe- what will people say? What if somebody found out that this is what I did or this is what I said? Or how would we feel? For some of us, you know, as a result, because of these bad decisions, we've strayed from our marriage. And we feel like we, you know, our, our spouse feels completely betrayed as a result. And we feel completely guilty. Now, our spouse might have forgiven us, but we still feel guilty. And years later... You know, you find that you, your children, you find like you have a strained relationship with your kids and your spouse, because even though God has forgiven you and your spouse has forgiven you, you still haven't forgiven yourself. So, and I know that as a result, a lot of people get divorced today and 
they get this real sense of guilt. And, and you know, what happens with guilt is, see, guilt is never from God. Conviction is. But what happens with guilt is guilt puts us in the position of where we start to evaluate ourselves as, as though we're God. And we say, if I, wish, if, if I would have just tried harder, if I would have done this, you can't live in the I wish I could have anymore. It's past. We can't, and what happens is we get stuck there. We get stuck in that place and we fail to understand that that's past. You can't change that. That there's a tomorrow and God wants you to live in that tomorrow. Some of us, we might look at the way our kids turned out. You know, we look at some things and, and we say, I wish I would have been a better parent. And yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. Yes, we wish you would have been a better parent. But what are you going to do right now? What are you going to do right now? And so what I feel is that a lot of people sometimes feel like David. When David said this in Psalm 38, verse 4, he said, my guilt has overwhelmed me. It's overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to, to bear. David said that. David, the man that, that wrote the most beautiful Psalms, yet carried a burden that, was, that made him feel guilty. And here's what I want you to understand today. Here's what I'm hoping that you will walk away with today is that every person that God has ever used, every saint has a past and every person, every sinner has a future. You hear me? Every saint has a past. Everybody in this room, we have a past, but every sinner has a future in Christ. That's what I want you to know today. We all have a future. So you look everywhere in the world, every person that God has ever used, whether in the word of God or even to this day, in some way or another, God, they all have a past that they had to overcome by the power of Jesus Christ. They overcame it. Every sinner that, that includes you and me has a future in Christ. Amen. And I'm about to share with you something that I've only shared two other times. So you guys are in for a treat. I, I'll never forget the story that I, I, I've regretted my entire life. By the way, last year, last sad Sunday, I shared with you something that happened in fifth grade. This also happened in fifth grade. Fifth grade was an eventful year for me. It was a very eventful year for me, okay? This was something that was very small and insignificant, became the worst event of my life, okay? So I'm going to share the story. So back when I was in fifth grade, and uh, um, I had a friend. Actually, my friend, one of my friends is, is Steve Santano's older brother. His name was Marcos. And Marcos, back in those days, we didn't have Game Boys, PlayStations. We have Xbox, all right? We didn't have none of that stuff. What we had is, remember the arcade room? The arcade, I don't know, how, many, how many of you remember the arcades, right? Well, what they it came up with this ingenious idea. What if we shrunk the arcade down to tabletop size? So it was about this tall, right? And it was like Donkey Kong Jr., and he would bring it to school and we would play. And one day I told him, I said, can I, take, can, I, can I take it home? Can I take it for the weekend? Sure, no problem. Marcus was like, yeah, sure, here you go. So I took it home for the weekend. Well, during that time, my, our house was under construction. My, our house was always under construction. My dad was working on a project all the time, tearing the wall, whatever. And our stairs were not carpeted yet. It was still wood. And I remember I was at the top of the stairs and I'm doing what all the other kids were doing. Not paying attention. And what I do, I lost my grip and the thing fell down the stairs and shattered to pieces. So I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? Now, I'll go to school. I'm trying to avoid Marcus as much as I can, but he's sitting next to me, so I can avoid him. So he's, he, one day he's like, so where's my game? Oh, I'll get it for you. I'll get it for you. I'll get it for you. Two, three days. Where's my game? Finally, I had to fess up. And I said, man, Marcus, I'm sorry. I said, I told him the truth. I said, this is what happened. This thing fell and it broke to pieces, right? And he, Marcus was animated, very animated. He's like, dude, he's like, that, that thing cost my dad $10. Now, you need to understand that when I was in fifth grade, $10 was like 50 bucks. All right. You don't come by $10 that easy when you're, when you're in fifth grade, especially when you lived in my side of the city. All right. That was a lot of money to come by. And he's like, I, I, here's, here's the bad part. Here's what scared me is that his dad knew my dad. So I was afraid. So I, he's like, dude, I got to tell my dad. I'm like. No, no, I'll get you your $10. I'll get you your $10. So here I am. I go home. I'm, I'm, and still, days pass. I'm avoiding him. He's like, where's my $10? I'll see him in school. Where's my $10? I'm like, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Back in those days, it took me a long time to collect $10. Okay? So one day, I'm coming to school. And it's a cold winter day. I remember coming into school. And he's the first, of course, he always greeted me with, where's my $10? Never said, hi, how are you, man? It's good to see you. It's, where my $10? And I remember it was the first thing he said. And the first thing I blurted out was, 
dude, I got robbed <laughs> on the way to school. Now, if y'all don't know Marcus, Marcus is super animated. I made the mistake of saying that because right there he was like, what? Oh, my God. And why? Why on this day, on this holiest of days, why did our principal have to be walking by at the time? And he goes, oh, my God, Mr. Wagner, Moses got robbed. <laughs> Mr. Wagner and his caring self gets on his knees to my level. What happened, son? Are you okay? He's looking me over, making sure I'm not. You, I'm like, yep. Now I had the opportunity, folks, in that moment. Say, no, it's, I'm not telling the truth. It's a lie. But I ran with it. <laughs> and he's like, what happened? And I'm like, well, I was, I was coming down the street. And I'm telling you, I got the, the, the film was rolling in my mind. I had, I was, it was coming. I had everything. And he's like, well, well, you know what? Come with me. Oh, my God. Now we're going to the principal's office. As I'm leaving, I remember this day clearly. As I'm walking out the door to the principal's office, I look back and Marcus is standing. It's like, it's going to be okay. <laughs> I was stepping into a world, ladies and gentlemen, I've never been in this world before. And now we go down to the principal's office. I'm telling you, everything I'm telling you is absolutely 100% true. So we go down to the principal's office as I'm there and he gets his secretary and she sits down. He goes, okay, don't worry. We're, we're going to help you out. We're going to figure this thing out. And lo and behold, here comes the Rochester police department walking into the, they called the police. They called the cops. Cause apparently if there's somebody out there robbing kids on their way to school, you got to. So the cops come in, guy sits down. He's like, son, tell me what's happening. I'm going to tell you, he's like, tell me what the guy looked like. I gave him a picture of an imaginary person that looked very real. I described what he had on, how, how he looked, the color of his eyes, the ring on his finger. I mean, I had details, ladies and gentlemen. All right. And who's the next person to walk into the room? He says, you know what, son, that's all great information. Why don't you tell this lady she's a sketch artist for the Rochester Police Department? All right, they bring in this lady, and she's drawing this picture. I'm like, yep, that's him. Yep, that's exactly, yep, that's exactly what he looks like. She drew an imaginary guy, and the next, you think it gets worse, the next step is my mom and dad come in the door. Listen, my dad worked for Rochester Product, which is a division of General Motors. He worked all, from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. He was at work, and he gets a phone call from my mom. Hey, something happened. You got to come to the school. My mom didn't drive, so he had to leave his job, pick up my mom. They're rushing to school, and my dad walks in. What happened? What happened? What happened? You okay? And so we're doing all this stuff. They, they filed a report. By the time I left, they had typed up a letter that went home with every single one of the kids <laughs> saying, be careful. There's a man of this description. Watch your kids. In this area... You guys think I'm, this is, this is real life. I'm going to make a movie of this. <laughs> okay, now, during all of this time, I had the opportunity to say, it's a lie! But I ran with it. And then, so they say, son, you know what? You've had a traumatic morning. Why don't you go home with your mom and dad? I got a day off from school at least. <laughs> so I get in the car, I'm in the back seat, mom and dad are driving home, and the only person that had absolutely any good sense of how to ask the right question was my dad. My dad kind of looks over to my wife, and he looks back, he says, so where'd you get the $10? <laughs> so where'd you get the $10? Because I don't remember giving you $10, where'd you get the $10? I was like, Dad, I said, I don't, I, it, was just, I, it was in my pocket, maybe it was from the laundry. Like, I must have gotten $10 from a birthday a long time ago, and it's been stuck in those pants. And he was like, oh, mm, okay. And that was it. Next day, I go to school. Marcus is there. My friends are there. They're like, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> Don't worry about that. It, Marcus forgave me for that. He forgave me. But today, if you go in 1980-something and go to the Rochester Police Department, there's a sealed, unsolved mystery <laughs> of a guy that doesn't exist 
who robbed a kid of money he never had. Today. This is the God's honest truth. God's honest truth. Now, now, I know it seemed like I got away with it. I know it did. But the truth is that that event has haunted me for my entire life. It really did. It haunted me for years. I mean, I felt horribly guilty. So one day, because I felt so horrible, I had to tell my family. And I remember I waited to the 15 years later. Because I needed to make sure I was old enough not to get whooped. So I got married, and then it was shortly after I got married, my entire family was at my brother, sister, their spouses, and I stood up and I said, guys, I want to tell you the truth about what happened. And I said to them, and my mom's like, what? And my dad's like, I knew it. I knew it. (laughs) But I told them, now I'm a man. You can't whoop me. I'm a grown man. I'm just confessing. I have to get this off my, let you know that this is the truth of what happened and because of that, and listen, listen, and listen, not too long after that, I remember I, I got with Stephen and his brother owns a successful business chain in Buffalo. I said, Steve, we, we got to go visit your brother. I was with him and we go visit his brother and we're sitting down and I'm telling him, he goes, where's my $10? <laughs> Did I give it to him? I don't know if I gave it to him. <laughs> But I'm trying to tell you, listen, that little escapade of my whole life, that little story, that little mini series on television right now, that thing, what it did is it it made it easy for me to become a good liar. It made it really easy. And so I would lie to get out of things as often as I needed. And then one day I read that scripture in 1 Corinthians says that liars will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. I'm like, I got to get this right. I got to get this right. And so I've lived with regret because of that day. So listen, when we talk about failure, I would love to tell you that that was the worst thing that I ever did in my life. But the truth is my life is riddled with failures. It's riddled with one failure after another. I'll never forget when we started this church, my dear pastor, uh, who was not a church planter, gave me a book and said, hey, read that book. That should help you plant the church. Can I tell you, we feel that everything that was in every chapter of that book. But had we never failed, right, we wouldn't get to where we're at today. So with failures, it's failure. But listen, there are too many of us that are living based on our past, right? You're, we're still gripped by the thought of failure. So this whole series, this whole event of failures in our lives sometimes keeps us gripped. And if we're honest with ourselves, some of us, some of us we're still like Uncle Rick, Rico living in 1982, if you've ever watched Napoleon Dynamite, he, he was the man that lived down by, in a van down by the river. And it's because he still lived in the past saying, man, if coach would have let me in, we would have won state finals and, and that would have been great. No, you see, a lot of us still live like if I would have done this and if I would have said that and if I would have gone that way, you're not there anymore. So you got to get past your past to where you're at today and face the reality that God is a God of goodness and grace and wants to help you get past that, Uncle Rico. So how do we do it? Can I say something that a lot of times based on our failures? Because of our failures, we make a lot of decisions based on fear. Can I help you with that? We make decisions based on fear. Let me give you an, an example. Let's just say, I'll talk to the men. Men, if you have an addiction, a sexual addiction, addiction to porn, all right? What happens is you want to get right. You feel conviction. You feel guilty. So what happens, you say, well, I'm never going to turn on my computer. And I'm never going to use my smartphone. And I'm not, because why? That's fear motivated. And what happens is anytime you make decisions that are based on fear, you will do it again because fear keeps you enslaved, right? But a decision based on faith says, I know this is sin, so I'm going to do it according to the word of God. James 5 tells me that if I confess my sins one to another and pray for each other, that I will be healed. So what does that tell me? That tells me that I've got to be man enough to say, to find another brother in Christ and say, I need help with this addiction. Can I call you when I feel weak? Can I call you when I feel this way? Can you pray with me? Because the Bible says if you do it faith way, you'll get healed. But if you do it by fear, you'll stay stuck in it forever. Same thing with financial, uh, financial issues. We make decisions, but well, I, I got, if I don't do this, I, I'm not going to pay the tithe because I need this. And, and that's fear. It's not faith. Faith says I'm going to obey the word of God, even when it's difficult. And I'm not going to make decisions based on fear. Fear wants to keep you a slave. If you've, had, if you've had trouble in your marriage, right? Let's just say there was an emotional affair, any type of affair. What happens is now it creates this heightened awareness where now you're super fearful. 
Oh, I got to be careful where, do I, where I go and what I do. And some of that's healthy. Some of that's healthy. Let me say that. But if you live, if you make every decision based on fear and not faith, you'll fall back into it. Here, I'll give, you, I'll give you another example. When we were growing up in the church that I came from, we used to do this play every year. This play every year, which was about life. And we'd have a hell scene and the devil. And let me tell you, we'd have the altars full of people who came to the altars out of fear of not wanting to go to hell. And then next week, wouldn't see them. And the week after, we wouldn't see them. We wouldn't see them until the next year when the play happened again. Why? Because fear doesn't produce anything inside of you. It's a motivator, but it's temporary. Faith is what produces life inside of you. And so we cannot, and now the enemy wants to keep you locked up in fear, locked up. And he, he wants you to base the decisions. You see the failures you've made in your past. So therefore be fearful of the things you've done, of the places you've been. Be very fearful. And we, we, we build up these fearful walls and all we do is enslave ourselves to the past. The enemy wants to trap you into living your life, living your life in fear based on past failures. That's how he traps you. It's not, it's not that you're living in the past. It's that you're making your decisions for today based on fears from your past. And he wants, Jesus wants to set you free. See, one has to do with legalism and the other has to do with grace. Legalism says you better do all these things. Be careful to do all these things. Do all these things and you won't fall. That's legalism. Grace says there's not enough things you can do to keep yourself from falling. But if you fall in love with Jesus and you lie and obey his word and get the right people in your life, God will give you the grace that you need to overcome it. Come on. You got to hear me because there are a lot of us I've talked. I've had conversations with a lot of people and I hear the motivation is fear. The motivation is fear. I, had this, I knew this one young lady, great young lady, loves Jesus. But I, and one of the things she would always tell me, she was a vegetarian. I always mess with her. You need a little chicken sometimes. No, girl, you need some chicken because you're too skinny. Let me give you some chicken, right? And she, she would often bring up her mom. <clears throat> How her mom was, her mom was a manic depressive, her mom had, was whatever, had all these things. And so she found that her mom only balanced herself with having the right diet. And so what her motivation was, I wasn't eating veget uh, not, not, I wasn't eating meat just because, uh, you know, I just want to be healthy. It's because I was fearful that I'd be like my mom. You see what I'm saying? It's fear motivated. So what decisions have you been making that have been motivated in fear because of past failures in your life? And that's what Jesus wants to set you free from. He does it. You don't need to be there. Legalism, legalism is motivated by fear. Grace is learning to live in freedom by living according to God's word. Christ has forgiven you. You have to forgive yourself. That's the key. You have to forgive yourself. And here's the next step and follow God's process. It's so important. So important. Why? Because you'll be healed. You'll be restored. You won't have to live with that mindset anymore. Here's what Romans 8 15 says. I love what it says. It says the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live, what? In fear again. It says, rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. Now you're a son and a daughter. You don't have to be afraid. And by him we cry, Daddy. You're not, you don't have to make decisions in fear. So I want to give you three ways today that I believe three ways that are going to help you break this thing. And the first thing that in order for you to help you get past your past failures is you've got to recognize that your biggest sins are not too big for God's grace. Your biggest mistakes are not too big for God's grace. You go, now, listen, I've been a follower of Jesus for whew, a long time. But one thing that's been profoundly aware to me is that a lot of people live consumed by guilt. A lot of Christians live consumed by guilt. Guilt doesn't come from God. It never came from God. The enemy wants you to always feel guilty. Why? Because guilt will paralyze you into performing an action that you need to do to get free. Guilt says, oh, I don't know. I don't know. See, guilt and fear go hand in hand. I don't know. I don't, you know, I've done, I've done that before. I don't know. That's what guilt says. Where conviction says, yes, Lord, I know this is wrong. Teach me the way I should go. That's conviction. And so what happens is that you will start to, guilt says to us, you know, I'll never be able to conquer this thing. I'm never going to get, get, get over this failure. Even when I try, Pastor, I've tried a hundred times. That's what guilt says. You see, what happens, the other thing that guilt does is it breeds self-hatred. 
And you begin to loathe some things. You know, it begins to stir, stir in your life and you loathe it. And the Bible talks about the, this other thing, but it's called conviction. I love conviction. I don't always love it, but it's a good thing. Conviction, we need it. Conviction of the Holy Spirit. Because it, conviction is the only thing that produces change in our lives. Guilt is what church people make you feel when they're judging you. Conviction is what the Holy Spirit makes you feel when he wants to transform you. You know it because you see, see, he's the only one that puts his finger on the things that are in your life that he knows he wants you to change. And you'll know it. Yeah, I got to change this. I got I to gotta change this, right? But guilt makes you, guilt comes from the outside and then it's produced on the inside where people make you feel guilty. And then you start to believe the lie of the enemy and that's guilt. God doesn't operate by guilt. He operates by conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's why John writes in 1 John 1, 9, he says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purifies us from all unrighteousness. What's he asking us to do? To do 12 Hail Marys and stand on our, on our hands? No, no, no. He's saying simply, he said, confess your sins to God. Repent of it. Repent. And God says, I will forgive you and I will purify you of all unrighteousness. He wipes the slate clean. Anybody remember this? Kids, let me help you understand this. This was my iPad growing up. Okay? This is my iPad. What I like about this iPad, you don't need Wi-Fi for it. And you can't watch videos. Nope, okay, it's a downfall. Well, that's a good thing. You don't watch videos. But what I love about this Etch-a-Sketch is that, right, you could draw, well, I don't know where my, there's my line. You don't see my line, but you could draw these lines. And if you're really gifted and talented and you have seven, 17 hours to spend on this, you could probably draw a city silhouette or whatever, different things. What, what I like about it is that when you make a mistake, right, what do you do? Right? And it's gone. And what this reminds me of is that in our life, you know, we've got all these mistakes, these lines that we've created, these things. And all God does is, he says, if I'm faithful and just, if you'll just confess your sin, I'll, I'm going to wipe it clean. And, I'll, and I love that scripture and it says that as far as the east is from the west, I will remove your sin. I will remember it no more. That's what he says. And I love that. This is what God, our life is an etch sketch with full of mistakes and lines. But God says, what mistakes? What lines? I've, I've erased those things. You don't have that anymore. See, you still remember it. The enemy wants to keep you guilty about it. But God says, what, what, what did you do? I don't even remember. It's not even there. That's what God does with his word. That's what God does with you. He, he cleans you clean up. He doesn't, and he doesn't hold it ever against you. You know, we hold it against ourselves. Even our spouse, if she's forgiving you, you, she won't hold it, but you hold it against yourself. The enemy wants to keep you trapped in a prison of guilt. And God said, I've set you free. I've set you free. I don't know, what, what's, what's your etch sketch say to you? What's, it, what's in your etch sketch today? Is it lying, pride, unfaithfulness, cheating? What is it? Maybe you've been envious of other people. Maybe, you know what, here's a tough one. Maybe, maybe one of the things you've been guilty of, maybe the things that the enemy is trying to hold on you is at some point in your life you made a mistake and maybe a, a child was lost. Maybe you aborted a child. You know, these are some heavy things that the enemy puts on people and makes you feel guilty for the rest of your life. And Jesus says, I've remembered it no more. I've removed it. I've removed the guilt. I've forgiven you. And we still hold on. And you got to get the etch a sketch out and remember that Jesus has forgiven you. And I love it. He doesn't, he doesn't stop there. Listen, Jeremiah 31, 34 says this. I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sin no more. That's a choice that God makes today. I remember it no more. We have to recognize that there is no sin that you will ever commit or have ever committed that is too big for God's grace. Amen. Here's the second thought I want to give you today. Is that you're not what you've done. You are who God says you are. Now, this is important because a lot of times we, we sometimes attach the things that we've done and we've created a label in our lives, right? Because your sin doesn't define you. Your identity isn't, isn't what you did, okay? You're the very product and the identity of who God is out of his word. That's who you are. God defines you. You see, the enemy tries very hard to personalize your sin. Because what he wants to do, he wants to create a mindset in your life where the thing you, you, the, the thing you uh, committed is who you become. So if you've been, you were an adulterer, what happens is that's your label. I'm an adulterer. 
instead of you know realizing that you've made a, a, a grievous mistake and it's time to step away from that and say, God, I've repented of this thing. See, because you need to understand that he is, he's, he is, the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. So if you've stolen, guess what? You, he labels you a thief. And that's the label that you will carry for the rest of your life. I'm a thief. I can't help it. Listen, I had a friend of mine who went through a very well-known 12-step program who had some issues with drug addiction, right? And I remember having this conversation. We were having coffee together. And, and we were saying, he goes, you know, but I'm an addict. I'll always be an addict. And I said, why, why are you saying that? I understand the process. I get why they want you to say that. There's got to be an awareness and there's got to be this place where you, yes, there's admission. That's important. That's great. And this program. But he kept saying, yeah, he goes, but I'll always be an addict. I said, but the, every time you confess that over your life, you're confessing that at any single moment, you will slip back into it because you are always an addict. I said, why can't you say I used to be an addict, but God set me free and I'm no longer an addict. And it was hard for him to get past that statement because why the enemy wants to keep you. He wants to label you based on the things you've done. You're not an addict. You're a child of God. You're redeemed. You're righteous. You're holy. That's who you are. And I tried to convince him of it. He wouldn't have nothing to do it. Do with it. God is able to deliver and heal you. Sin is the event. It's not who you are. Sin is the event. It's what you did. It's not who you are. Last week, I opened up with this verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. It says, therefore, if any was in, anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. You're new. The old is gone. The new is here. So listen, if you're struggling in a specific area in your life, it's easy to feel like a failure. I get it because I've been there. It's easy to feel like a failure. It's easy to say, God, why am I going through this? Why can't it just pass? God, well, just when I thought was, it was all over, God, why am I back to square one? Well, I want to tell you this, that sometimes failure is something that God uses to get us from where we are to where he wants to take us. Failure is oftentimes the thing that God uses to take you from the position that you're at right now to take you to where he wants you to be in, in, his, in his kingdom, in his life. Well, what does that mean, Pastor? Well, failure isn't always necessarily bad. Okay? Failure isn't bad at all. Fa- failure happens so that we can learn something. That's why failure happens. When you disobey your parent, you learn something. You learn that you disobey them, you get a whooping. Huh? I learned from that one. If you keep getting whoopings, it's because failure hasn't taught you anything, and you need harder whoopings. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody was a hard-headed, knuckle-headed kid that needed more than just, come on, you know, if you're here, thank God you're here. Praise God. But listen, failure, failure is a thing that God allows to happen in our lives so that we can learn. It's a teacher, right? Thomas Edison. How many of you know Thomas said it? Do you know he failed at the light bulb more than 2,000 times? I would have quit after 10. I, would, I don't get this. I can't get this. I can't get this. But you know what? He was being interviewed by a reporter. A reporter wanted to try to, you know, put him on blast. And here's what he told the reporter. He said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that it won't work. Change of perspective. He said, you know what? I've used every opportunity I could as in failure to, make, to, to, do some, to learn something new. So I'm like, okay, I, that wire won't work there, so get that one out. That wire doesn't work, so they get, see, it's about learning, right? Michael Jordan, probably one of the greatest basketball players of all time, he was quoted saying this. He said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games 26 times. I've been trusted to take the game's winning shot, and I missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. You got to learn from your failures, right? It's called failing forward. You got to, you know what that means? It's not, failure isn't an excuse for you to keep on failing. Failure isn't an excuse for you to keep on sinning either. Failure happens so that you can learn from it and fall forward into the next thing. That's why it happens. It's, it's not an excuse. Well, so what does it say? Failure says, get back up, get back up and keep going. You get back up and you keep going. But God, who is abounding in love and grace, poured grace on you so that you can experience forgiveness and freedom. And God will begin to change you as he convicts you of sin. So you fail, you get back up. Fail, you get back up. Fail, you get back up. You have to understand something. You've been adopted into God's family. You're his family. And he sees you in your failure. He sees you when you mess up. And you know what he says? Get back up. I love you. Full of grace and mercy. He says, get back up. You know what the Bible says about you? It says that you're blessed going in 
and you bless going out. You got to change what the enemy's been saying about you. The Bible says that you're more than overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. That's what the word of God says. The Bible says that you're free because Jesus set you free and who the son sets free is free indeed. The Bible says that the same spirit or the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, who does it live inside of? You. It lives inside of you. And that's thing, that is true about you. Listen, you are not what you've done. It doesn't define you. That was just an event. You are a child of God. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Here's a third thing I want to give you. And it's this. Is that you cannot change your past, but Christ can change your future. You can't change the past, but Jesus can change the future. Let's start with the past for a minute. Maybe someone hurt you badly. Maybe there was a tragedy. Painful words. There's a lot of different things I can paint in this picture. I'm, a lot of hurtful things that have happened to a lot of us. And a lot of times what happens is the enemy will use these events for us to shoot blame on others. It's your fault that this happened to me. It's your fault. It's your fault. But see, we can't, you, you can't change what happened to you. Can I just be, you cannot change what happened to you. Your last marriage might have just been a dream of the good marriage that you thought you wanted, but it ended in an agony. But you can't change it. Maybe you were young, you did something stupid. You regret it. You can't change it. Maybe if that was you when you were young and you had a child and you decided to give that child up or abortion, listen, my heart breaks for you. But here, this should come for you to know that, that that child is with Jesus today. But you can't change it. You can't change it. You can't change the past. Maybe there was something that you said, something that you did. You shouldn't have done it. You should have never said it, but you can't change it. I'm telling you, you can't change it. But you got to move forward. You can't change the past. For a lot of us, we still have that, I wish, Pastor, I wish I could have, I should have. Nope, you cannot change it. You have to move forward. God's power invites you to move forward. See, you need to understand. I know, I know that a lot of times, listen, this, this, a lot of you go to bed at night and you get these thoughts. A lot of you have conversation with your friends and you have these thoughts. And God is saying, you cannot change the past. I'm inviting you into today. I'm inviting you into a brighter future. And so the enemy would love to always remind you of the past. Always. Isn't it always the enemy? Usually it comes in the sound of a friend's voice <laughs> or someone on Facebook. Always the enemy wants to bring up your past, bring up your dirt, talk about you, remind you. Especially, how, how, has this ever happened to you? Like you, you're in a groove, you're in love with Jesus, you're serving God, things are going well. And then the enemy starts whispering nonsense about your past to you. If people only knew. You really think that you're going to get away with this? And you start to deal with this, this stuff. But here's what you do. Whenever the enemy starts whispering that nonsense to you, whenever he starts to remind you of your past, you need to remind him of his future. You need to let him know, you know what? That's true. And you can, you can say, you know what, devil? That's right. That's right about me. That's true about me. I was this. I was a whoremonger. I was an altar. I cussed like a sailor. I did the up. I did all those things. But you failed to understand one thing, devil, is that I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And God does no longer live. The Bible says that he forgives my sins and remembers them no more. But devil, let me remind you about your future. Because you really don't have a future. You got to kind of remind him. You got to remind him that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You got to remind him. You got to remind him that you serve a God, a good God that is working a good even through the bad things in your life. God is working a good in your favor. You got to remind him. And then you remind him what's, what's going to happen to him. Because he's read the book. Again, Siri? I got to turn her off during service. She's too nosy. But I love what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. He said, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved all things, all these things. In other words, he said, I'm not perfect or that I've already reached perfection. Look what he said, but I press on. I press on. 
And that's what God wants you to do today. That's what God's power and grace does. He's empowering you to do. He says, press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. He said, dear brothers and sisters, I haven't achieved it. Look, God, remember last week I said that God gives you the grace to grow into it. He said, I haven't achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. I love how he says this one thing, but it really talks about two things. (laughs) Forgetting the past. Somebody say this, forgetting the past. Somebody say it, forgetting the past. And look at that. He says, and looking forward to what lies ahead. And then he says, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God called me through Christ Jesus. God's calling us to press on the past. Just press on. I want to invite the worship team to come. We've got to get past it. I just want to be real honest with us sometimes because I know sometimes, listen, I'm your pastor and I still struggle. There are some things that the enemy tries to bring up from my past, even recent past. So for some of you, it could be a recent past. And the enemy tries to bring that up. Listen, God says you're redeemed. I love you. I've purchased you. Shut the enemy's mouth up. Yes, you had an ugly past. It's okay for us to admit that. Yes, I've had an ugly past, but I have a beautiful future. (laughs) You might have an ugly past, but you have a beautiful future in Christ. From this moment forward, everything that has happened in the past no longer matters. What matters is what Christ has decided for your future. And I love what the Bible says. He's predestined it. I've got a bright future ahead of me. And that's how you've got to walk around. You've got to walk around with that confidence. I know, devil. I've done these things. I've said these things. I've been forgiven, but I've got a bright future. I've got a bright future in Christ Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with me? Would you bow your heads? I want to read this amazing story about this couple that I read about this week. There's a couple. His name is Jerome and her name is Shana. I love this amazing story. I'm hoping it will inspire you. This is a story of real life change. People that had ugly pasts but learned how to get past their past into a bright future. Jerome, listen to this, Jerome was a drug dealer for most of his life. One day he went to church and he gave his life to Jesus. And he started to faithfully attend the church, but soon he realized that he had no income because he had been a drug dealer for so long that it was his only primary income. He had never had a legal job in his entire life. But he's given his life to Jesus. He wants to make his work. So his pastor said, listen, his pastor said, I'm going to help you find a job. So they sit down one day and they begin to put a resume down and realize that he had nothing that he can put on the resume. So different people from the church began to give him a reference. This is this guy named Jerome. With a little help of the church, he got, a, he got his first job. Shortly after, within a year or two, Jerome started to date this girl that was coming to the church as well. She was a new Christian. Listen to this. He was a drug dealer. She had been a stripper since she was 17 years old. I don't know what state this is in. But she surrendered her life to Jesus and she was now living the transformed life. Jesus had changed her life. Here you have a former drug dealer and a stripper. Over time, their relationship flourished and they got married. And even though they both struggled financially in the beginning, God began to bless their lives. And after saving some money, Jerome became a Christian businessman and he owned several rental properties in the city. And because of how good God had been to him, Jerome started to use some of his homes to house homeless families until they were able to get back on their feet. Shana, who was now a homeschool mom of three kids, they decided to take in two foster children. And today, they both have ministries that help people get off drugs and help girls get free from sex trafficking. Now, if God can take a former drug dealer and a stripper who had ugly past and turn them into some of the greatest ministers, what excuse do you have? That you can't say no to your past and shut your past off and say, it doesn't matter. I've got a bright future in Christ Jesus. Come on, if they can do it, what can you do for him? Come on. Here's 
what I love. The word, the, the word, getting, forgetting what is past, that phrase in the Greek, let me share it with you. It means to treat it with thoughtless intention. It means to willfully neglect it. It means to leave behind intentionally. It means to banish from one's thoughts. It means to disregard on purpose. It means to cease from remembering. There's some things you've got to just tell the devil, I'm not going there. Not today, devil. I've got a bright future. God's got something better for me. I'm not going to linger in the past anymore. Come on, with your head smile. Listen, there's some of you here today that perhaps you're still struggling with your past. Perhaps the enemy has you convinced that you'll never get past it. Perhaps you get the enemy has you convinced that how can God forgive you? How could God ever forgive you for those things? How could you ever, how could a good God, if he's such a good God, how could he ever? Let me tell you, it's because he's a good God. That's why he can't. And I'm going to tell you today, I really feel this in my heart, that some of you have been carrying a lot of guilt and a lot of weight on your life. And you've, you've, it's been hard for you to forgive yourself. And God is saying, today, today, I want you to free yourself from your past. Today, I've given you the power to get free from it today. And if that's you, listen, if you feel that way and you want it broken today, right where we're at, just lift your hand, just lift your hand. I want to pray for you. Lift your hand. I want to pray for you. Lift your hand. Lift your hand. Lift your hand. Listen, come join me off the altar. We're going to do this together. Join me altar. We're going to break this thing off today. Just join me right here up front. We're going to pray together.